Hi, it's Mike with UTastic. I'm here at GoToConf 2015, and I'm standing here with Mads Torgerson, who talked about the future of C Sharp. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. So, the future of C Sharp, what is what's in the crystal ball? Well, there are um, a bundle of things that are in the very near future of C Sharp, mm -hmm. which means we release in a couple of months. We just put out a release candidate for it. Um, one being several language features for C Sharp itself, um, which are all sort of in the category of helping clean up the code and remove boilerplate and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty lightweight features, if you will, right. but should make everybody's code look nicer. The signatures um, of funk and, and types and T are going to go away? Uh, well, so, so some things are uh, a lot of member declarations will get shorter. Mm -hmm. We'll have um, um, shorthands for what we call the null conditional operator, where you lots more null checks become implicit. We have you know, various little features that mm -hmm. just uh, make your code safer and nicer um, in various ways. So right. Lots of little features. Um, and that's kind, of, that's kind of not the most exciting thing that's right. happening with C Sharp, actually. Um, we're, the, the main thing, I think, is that we're sort of almost putting out a new kind of tech, like mm -hmm. sort of a language engine. We call it Project Rosling. That is, a, 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 it's, at the core, it's a compiler. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that understands. It's, it's the thing that we build our compiler with. Right. It's, also, it, it's also underlying the tooling experience in Visual Studio. Um, it's a, so it's a very deep language understanding engine, if you will. It's mm -hmm. both good at uh, compiling uh, with high throughput to uh, you know uh, to some executable, but it's also really good at being uh, sitting behind an ID and, and being reactive uh, to, at, a, at a typing speed right. while answering all kinds of uh, deep questions about the uh, the code. And it's also good at uh, performing custom analysis that people write for it. And this is one of the things that I think is really exciting about it is that it provides a, a a, a complete and and uh, efficient API on top of the whole language that people can write to, and they can write, you know, um, uh, batch static analysis over it. That's very very high fidelity. They can also write plugins that run in real time as you type and give you squiggles where they think that your code is wrong. Right. Offer suggestions for fixes that that can be executed. So lots of introspection type things. Uh, sort of you could call it compile time introspection. So it's that it's it's giving that ability to deeply understand the language. It's putting that in the hands of people who want to enhance the tool in a very easy fashion. And so I think we, you can, for instance, imagine people who write APIs and share them out, uh, whether within a company or publicly or whatever. What you could do now is to ship um, analyzers with your API that will help people use the API in the right way. Say, don't don't call it like this. Call it like this, or use it in this sequence. It can, you know, people can write very simple logic that discovers those patterns in yeah. people's code and give them real time feedback. Saying, Saying, here's how you should rather do it. Click the light bulb, and, it, and I'll fix it for you. Also, oh, like instead of just comments about deprecations, it could be like, oh, this method is old, and that could be something that could be surfaced through the IDE. Uh, it, certainly, I, any any pattern. The the it, essentially we have this hardened immutable object model of code that we present to uh, whoever wants to take advantage of it, right. want to plug in and take advantage of it. And they can look for whatever pattern they want in the code, syntactically, uh, semantically, following the static bindings. They can ask about all those things of the compiler in real time right. um, as advanced as they want it to and, uh, and give immediate feedback to the, to the eventual user of the ID who's, who's using that plugin. Interesting. So it's actually very, it's a very, um, um, it sort of opens a lot of doors for new tooling experiences, much more tailored tooling experiences yeah. depending on your environment, depending on what uh, libraries you use and so on, than people have had in the past. Interesting. And, you know, to kind of move over to some of the advancements in portability for the CLR, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the recent release of the uh, um, uh, visual code and promotion of running .NET code on non-Microsoft servers, um, how, how does this play into the Roslyn story? Well, it does, it does play very nicely together. First of all, um, the, uh, the Roslyn uh, source code is in C Sharp. Right. Um, so the fact that C Sharp runs, is going to run well on Linux and on Mac means that, well, the C Sharp language engine is going to run well there. So now we can support, um, people can use that engine to support IDE integration. Mm -hmm. um, it all, Visual Studio Code, for instance, um, does does make use of that. Where the um, uh, the way that the language engine 
runs with the IDE is not actually running inside of the IDE, but it's running as a separate um, process. Okay, so it's like on a your surface. Uh, on your Linux box, for instance, yeah. or uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's a surface that runs on the box or anywhere else. But then the latency <laughs> issues creep in, and then it just speaks a protocol, um, you know, through a pipe with the with the IDE, and there's a thin little integration layer in the IDE. And so is, is that the OmniSharp? The OmniSharp. Okay, exactly. yeah. Yes. So it uses OmniSharp uh, for that integration, and OmniSharp is also it's a great um, open project actually yeah. that with with Microsoft participation, but uh, driven by the community, it lets it easily integrate with um, with a ton of different IDEs. Yeah, I've seen it for Vim, like you're hooking into OmniSharp with Vim, and it kind of opens up. Right, Sublime Text and so on. There's yeah. a long list if you go to the website, and so this whole so uh, Roslyn is really the enabling technology for all okay. of that to happen. Interesting. Yeah, and so are are you looking at uh, other Products like Mono, who had been on uh, non.NET runtimes, are you? Are you, it's because of this now open Roslyn project? Is there more communication with Mono and absolutely? Folding in um, we have this formal entity now called the .NET Foundation, mm -hmm. um, of which both Microsoft and Mono and many others are members, and uh, and these projects um, are undertaken under that foundation, if right. you will. So uh, the essentially, it, you can think of uh, .NET on on uh, Linux and on Mac, you sort of think of them as the next version of Mono, if you will. Right. It's the, the source code is primarily derived from the Microsoft um, uh, from a Microsoft source codes uh, for, for Windows, but uh, they are essentially the next version, being more robust and and more um, more tailored for um, sort of a modern. Um, um, yeah, and it, this actually kind of brings me to even thinking about Office 365 and how it, it seemed like earlier uh, resistance from the Office team to adopt .NET uh, because you know they had their legacy code base and with all the the Win32 and, and C++ uh, for you know optimized speed, but now like Office 365 seems to be really getting some serious traction, and I'm presuming that's powered by uh, by ASP.NET on, on Roslyn. Are you working with some of these product teams internally um, to like? I don't identify? think there's, there's not a specific connection between okay. those two things. I think they're more expressive of a similar trend where yeah. we are happy to take yeah. our business to any platform. Right. Um, well, I was just seeing more of like how .NET might be becoming more important to the overall strategy inside of Microsoft and and looking beyond the Microsoft desktop platform and saying, okay, we have this tool inside our that's doing this amazing stuff for ASP.NET. Let's you know shore that up and and make it even stronger. I mean, does that even within any kind of strategy discussions you guys are working I, on? I, I think, so the way to look at it is not so much that .NET is the linchpin of everything we do to push into other platforms or to work in other places and in the cloud or whatever. It's it's really just one of the things that we're we're opening up. We yeah. stopped thinking about uh, Windows as the only platform for things and that goes across the board. It's not, sometimes .NET is enabling technology for that mm -hmm. and sometimes it's something else. You know, uh, Some things work uh, at the JavaScript level, cross-platform. Some things are actually uh, there's a ton of C++ code that um, that gets ported. That's a little harder to get to work cross-platform, but it's not impossible. And so it's not that .NET is sort of like the thing that we're shoving everything through yeah. or building everything on as we as we kind of expand to new places. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I remember when .NET came out, and the original marketing push was that. .NET as a future, and then it seemed like there was kind of a winnowing of, of like, okay, .NET really is just for server stuff, but now it seems like, okay, now we're going to expand what .NET can be used Yeah, for. I don't think we ever, like, thought, we didn't think of .NET for, as only for server stuff. I think it, it just, it's just one of those technology choices. Um, if you're looking at efficiency, like, systems level efficiency, you, you're going to pick C++. It's mm -hmm. still going to be faster than .NET or Java or whatever. Um, if you're looking at the the reach that you can get uh, on the web, for instance, well, yeah. you'll pick JavaScript, even though you don't have the same productivity and and performance uh, that you do in C sharp. For that vast space in the middle, you, yeah. uh, C sharp is a really good choice, and that's regardless of whether it's um, in the cloud or on on-prem servers or whether it's it's a, a, a client app. Like if you look at our own 
own uh, app ecosystem. Most things are written in C sharp um, on Windows, um, and uh, we don't have a, a Microsoft offering. Microsoft uh, or Samurai now uh, is our close partner in offering C sharp based uh, mm -hmm. development on other uh, client platforms. So um, you can kind of pretty much take it in, in any direction you want. I don't think we ever thought of it as not being for the whole range of clients from client to server. Okay. It was more that we kind of focused all that energy in the in yeah. the Windows space only. Yeah. Um, well, personally, I'm, I'm as a as a developer, I, I developed on Microsoft platforms for a decade and uh, you know moved to Ruby on Rails. But now what I've seen, I was one of the people who was tweeting, "Wow!" When Visual Studio, I'm um, Visual Code came out, and it's kind of exciting to look at ways to be able to take those old skills and apply them in a, in a broad space. But uh, it, it's an exciting time to yeah. be working at Microsoft as well because yeah. uh, we really have opened up a lot and we're not only becoming available and, um, on a much broader range of platforms, we're also doing it much more in the open. The open sourcing has been really exciting. The, the direct contact with the, the user community, the uh, contributions that we get through that, um, both in terms of proposals and discussions and down to code contributions on, uh, on our .NET uh, core um, uh, CLR and framework there, and to Rosalind itself, uh, the, the compiler engine, if you will. That's just staggering and amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. really great. It's very cool. Even from yeah. the outside, it's, it's really cool to see yeah. that those changes taking place. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you.